Now, okay, Lord, Holy Spirit, what should I do? Or you say, Holy Spirit, which bus is coming next? And then you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost. And then you keep still and look inwards to see the impression of the Holy Spirit upon your heart. Now, understand, there, when you give yourself to the Lord in prayers, what you fellowship with is what you begin to become. Good. What you fellowship with is what you begin to, be, what you begin to look like. If you fellowship with Hollywood, you look like Hollywood. If you fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you begin to become alert and aware of the Holy Spirit. Am I communicating with you? If you fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the impressions that will come to you at the bus stop would have come to you in the secret place first. So you begin to become acquainted with how he speaks. So when you stand at the bus stop and you say, Holy Ghost, which bus is coming next and which one should I enter into? The impressions that will come is not a strange impression. You would have been acquainted to it. You would have known it. And understand that the Lord does not give you instructions in complex matters when he has not started leading you in little matters. Like a sister that wakes up one day and wants to hear the Holy Spirit's voice about the brother that is sitting next to her, whether that is her husband or that is not her husband. And the last time she held the conversation with the Holy Spirit was the day she got born again. So there needs to be an acquaintance. And you need to understand that there is, the church of Christ is always in danger of familiarizing herself with the things of God at the expense of the God of the things. That was the discipleship process in the house of Eli. The sons of Eli were living in sin, sleeping with the women in the church, and spending the offering anyhow, and the nation of Israel did not mourn. The Bible did not record for us that Israel was crying. And then when they, they went to battle and the enemy took the ark, what happened? The Bible says that a man ran from battle, he came to tell the city, and the city began to mourn that the ark had been taken. The city did not mourn that they were in violation of the law of the Lord. The city did not mourn that their pastor was sleeping with the choir leaders inside the church. The city did not mourn that their, choir, their, their, that their pastors were spending the offering of the church without recourse and fear of the Lord. The city did not mourn, but it mourned that the Ark of Covenant was captured because in reality that Ark was an idol to them. It was what they can see. So their faith was associated with the Ark, not with the God of the Ark. And that is a major difference and distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That is why the New Testament says, without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. If you want to see God before you obey, you are finished. The scripture now tells us that when Eli had it also, they told Eli, the man ran and said, hey, hey, Baba, what is your it has happened though? Eli said, say on, speak on my son. He said, oh, your, your sons have died in battle. The Bible says when he heard that the ark of the Lord had been captured, he fell backward and broke his neck by the side of the gate. What killed him? It wasn't God that pushed him. Up. It wasn't the death of his son that killed him. It was the fact that the ark was taken. When the Lord came to him and said, oh, look, look. For the sins of your son which have confronted you about and you know about it and you did nothing, I am going to kill the two of them in one day. Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do as he pleases. But he's now breaking his own neck over the ark of the God he cares little or nothing about. And then when the daughter-in-law heard that the ark of his, his father-in-law was dead, the, the, his own husband was dead, he did not come under any bad pang. But when he heard that the ark of God was captured, the Bible says her pain came upon her. She gave birth to a child. She gave that child no future. She, she called the child Ichabod. It wasn't God that called the child Ichabod. It was the mother. Because she felt that the ark and God are the same. And placed a burden on a child who had no business, who did not participate in the waywardness and the backsliding of the fathers. And she also died. What am I saying? Your role in church is important. Leading the choir is important. Ministering the word is important. Going for evangelism is important. Doing missions is important. More important to, than all those things is your secret place and your place of fellowship with, with Jesus. 
What gives life? What supplies the energy of the Spirit for those things to be the hand of God on the face of the earth through you is the life that you bring from the secret place that you carry from the place of prayer into the open. Saul said, oh, um, someone came to Saul and said, what is the sound that I hear in your backyard? Is that not the sound of goats and ram and the bleating of sheep? Oh, he said, oh, um, it was the people that speared them and brought them home. As Samuel said, as the, Lord does, as the Lord delights in sacrifice and offering like in obedience, whoa, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Oh, the people brought it to give offering because that is, that's an answer that will, that will, you know, that will catch any pastor's heart. Ah, pastor, I stole the money in the office, Jerry, because we needed to build church. Don't bring it here. It was in disobedience. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is, the Holy Spirit as a dove, the emblems of Jesus, the emblems of the Father, the emblems of the Son and the Holy Spirit are descriptive. They are indicators for us to understand who they are and how to relate with them. The dove is gentle. The Holy Ghost will not force himself on you. If you say the Holy Spirit is forcing me to do that thing, ah, bro, don't do it. Oh. Don't do it. The Holy Spirit does not force anybody. He will nudge you. It will speak gently to you. Luke chapter 3 verse 22. You want to write that down? We need to move. Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. Mark chapter 1 verse 10. John chapter 1 verse 30 to 34. Number 2. The Holy Spirit is... The, the, another emblem for the Holy Spirit is water. Water. In baptism... The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, that when a man is saved, he's initiated into one spirit. Hallelujah. In Ezekiel, you will see the water coming out from under the temple as the spirit of intercession that engulfs the territory or that engulfs the land. Number three, Isaiah chapter, 40, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4, the Holy Spirit is typified fire. Purifying and cleansing. Let's run through this because I need to get to the anointing of the Holy Spirit and your ministry, your calling, your personal assignment. What you are here on the face of the earth to do. Your place of contribution. What you owe heaven, what you owe the earth, what, what you owe your generation. The contribution from you that makes the fullness of all contributions full. So we need to rush. We're going to run through this. Just This is something I'm sure most of us are acquainted with. Acts chapter 2 verse 2. The Holy Spirit is typified as wind and breath. Wind and breath. Luke chapter 24 verse 49. Clothes, garment. When the angel spoke to Mary, he says... He said, how shall these things be seen that I know no man? He says, the power of the highest will come upon you. He says, the spirit of God will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. It will blanket you. and be a war. The Holy Spirit is garment in the spirit. There's the garment of power. There's the garment of praise. The garment of wisdom. The garment of glory. Different garments in the spirit. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14 is the guarantee, the evidence of the purchased possession, the token of divine commitment to us. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 13, oil. We're going to talk about that later. If we don't get to it today, we'll get to it tomorrow or another time. The Holy Spirit is oil. Jesus said, the, 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 spirit, the, Lord has, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me because... Because, because. So the oil of God upon the life of a man, there's a reason for it. And there's a relationship between why you were sent into the earth and why you were anointed. There are people anointed for A, but they are doing B. How you know that you are doing the wrong thing is that there is no power and you are, that thing is taking your life. There is no grace to do that thing. Your health is going... Without doing much of that thing, your health is depleting. Because there's no supernatural supply of grace to do that thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
what I am doing, I was born to do this. All right? So I can be here, I can do this for four hours, five hours, ten hours. And my body will not take as much beating as a man that is not called to do it. If he does it for 30 minutes, at the rate and level at which I will do it, when he sits down, they will need to massage his body. If he does it long enough, he can die doing it. Because there is nothing in the kingdom that is done through flesh and blood. All right? When a man that is anointed is doing a thing, it looks so simple that a person that is not anointed thinks that anybody can do it. So you see a man that is in a teaching office, and you say, oh, teaching is, is it not just to open the Bible, read and explain? No, it is not. Amen? So, is the seal of purchase possession, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, tongues of fire. Acts of Apostles chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. Tongues of fire is symbolic of utterance. Baptism and utterance. The door of utterance is given to you so that you can speak with the tongue of the learned and speak in season what the mind and the will of God is concerning the matter. Amen? Amen. It's also described as a cloud. Atmospheres. You know, in the wilderness, the cloud followed them. The east wind blew that parted the Red Sea. It described as a cloud. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 and verse 22. Exodus chapter 40, verse 36 and verse 38. When you look at church history, some of the greatest warriors of the kingdom, when you read their biographies, they are almost always signs the day they were born. If you read Joseph Ibabalola's biography, there was a sign the day he was born. And that sign usually is associated with something natural, something atmospheric. Whether it was, was as he came out of the womb, whether there was thunder, brrr, and the mother took notes. The neighbor may not even hear the thunder because it was actually not a real thunder, as in thunder. It was a thundering in the spirit that the ears of his mother was open to hear. Like the voice that spoke to Saul on the way of Damascus, on the way to Damascus, no other person heard it except Saul of Tarsus himself. They saw the light, but they did not hear the voice. But Saul saw the light and he heard the voice because the voice concerned his commissioning. So there are supernatural occurrences that happen in a neighborhood where the person that the occurrence relates to can hear it, but every other person does not hear it. This is one of the reasons why it is a dangerous practice that God has given you a commission and a command and you are going to people to look for testimonies or confirmation who are not connected in the spirit or who do not have any leadership responsibility and oversight over you to be able to do that confirmation for you. Just because a man is an expert in the things of God or is filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean he's in a position where he can confirm the voice of the Lord that is coming to you. Usually, the one that is best in the position to confirm what God is saying to you is a man that you have a covenant relationship with in the spirit. So there's an obligation on the side of God based on the covenant that God has planted both of you in to speak to that man on your behalf. There is no busy budding or gossiping in the Holy Ghost. So he's not just going to go and tell a nobody about you. Sister, it might be no. It might be no. Emimo is not careless. Emimo is a god of order. Emimo knows that she has a pastor. Emimo knows that she has a church. Am I communicating with you? It is also the reason why it is a dangerous practice to go from church to church, from church to church, and be kneeling down in front of different pastors. Now, all the men you are kneeling down in front, even if they are godly pastors, they don't have that covenant as association or covering responsibility over you, so there are things they can't confirm for you. They can counsel you from the realms of scripture, but as, a, as, as it relates to prophetic confirmation, as to distinct instruction for your life, they can't do it. They can't do it. It is the reason why counseling is in the portfolio of a pastor. Because the pastor knows the flock. There are things that if she comes to me now to meet me and say, ah, pastor, this, 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 I can say no. 
not because it is not the will of God, but because there are things I know concerning her that if she moves now, there will be a problem in this area. So I'll say no. One of our sisters in the house was, you know, I know that wonderful sister, very sacrificial and all of that. And I know that she serves. But she's pressured with time. Oh, time. Time is going. I need to get married. Time is going. It's okay. So she comes and says, oh, this brother, this brother. Immediately they mention the brother. I said, that's not her husband. I had not even met him. I said, no, that's not her husband. Then they say, okay, okay. And then she kept on pushing and pushing. I said, so bring him. And when the guy came in, I said, this one. All right, no problem. Are you sure God has spoken to you? She said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. God has spoken to me. I said, my father, this is what God said to me. I said, bro, the Lord has spoken to you too. All right, no problem. You can marry. That is not where you want your pastor to come to. <clears throat> oh, no, 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 no. Because most people have never been in a supernatural church. A supernatural church has fundamentally the word of God as the compass that moderates all the activities. But also, a supernatural church has, a supernatural church is supposed to be prophetic. To be prophetic now does not mean that the pastor is a prophet. It means that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is flowing and can give current revelations on situations and prompt in the direction of correctness to a matter at hand. So, a pastor can validate a direction based on the impression of the Holy Spirit. He has that infrastructure. So, no, 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 no. That brother. He said, okay, no problem, you can marry. The God that will help her uncover the secret because God knows she's precious. The guy was married, had two children somewhere else. Move and marry, move and marry, I want to marry. I said, what if God did not come in mercy to help expose this? You would have gotten married. He would have defiled you. And he's a pastor in a church somewhere. And she came to me and said, Pastor, he says he wants to join this ministry. I said, from where? Is that how they join leadership here? No. Let him come and sit down. Let's see him. After he has done one year, we'll know whether number one, whether he's even a child of God or not, before we start talking about leadership. The brother that has two children somewhere married to another woman coming to you, how did he even travel this far with you that you did not see it? It tells us that there's something wrong with your secret place. Something is wrong. Now understand, at a personal level, if your life is not correct, you cannot participate at the corporate level in the move of God. So there is a move of God on the face of the earth, but the participation of different members of the body of Christ will, be, will differ to the degree of the alignment in their personal life with Jesus. So it can bring them up to be participants in the corporate move where they are also distributors of his grace, anointings, and ministries. So some Christians will never live past the struggle of personal Christianity because their Holy Spirit is always wrestling with him. Wrestling with him. The Holy Ghost will come at night, give him a dream. Once you wake up, say, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. And then as he's going, he's a, he begins to say, but Holy Spirit, come. Ten years after the Holy Spirit spoke, he has not changed his mind. And it's the reason why people don't have spiritual progress with God. Because the last instruction he gave to you, you didn't obey it. He will wait for you. Uh -huh. So, where were we? He said, oh, Lord, you, the last time I spoke to you was ten years ago. The discussion, we've not finished that discussion we had ten years ago. Because you have not obeyed it. Ah, Lord, how is that possible ten years ago? Yeah, 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 you've not obeyed it. <clears throat> God does not promote failing children. It's not an act of love. For God to promote a child that is failing. In the world, they can patch you up. In the kingdom, God does not. Because what is at stake? What is at stake? Huh. Uh, mm. How do you find pastors that carry a genuine call? And then after two years in ministry, he goes to a babalao to get power. What will make a man that started from the presence of the Holy Spirit? All right? He started out from the presence of the Holy Spirit and then at some point decided to go into occultism just to get power so that he can attract a crowd. What, how, how did that man get there? He didn't finish process. 
Am I communicating with you? Turn this thing down a bit. There's feedback. He didn't finish process. Because he did not allow God to kill the love for visibility. He didn't allow God to deal with the love for crowd. He didn't allow the Lord to deal with the desire to be preeminent. He was in the process. He jumped out. He had been called, but he had not been sent yet. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Lord will sit on a man. He knows the pride of our hearts. I told you some weeks ago. He came in the night and said, the Holy Spirit is the conduit and the revealer of motives. When I woke up, I, I didn't find that dream funny. What motive is he revealing? Am I not? I'm trying to not be, oh, what is the motive now? Am I communicating with you? I shared with you what happened at the table of the Lord. I, I think it's the last table of the Lord. The title of that table of the Lord was that I may know him. That was the title. And I began to prepare for the table of the Lord. And, you know, I just, I was at home here. And I was just praying. I said, you know what, Lord, me too. I want to know you. I just don't want to teach this thing. Talk to me about knowing you. Talk to me about knowing you. And where I was praying, praying, I slept off. And I had a dream. And in the dream, I found myself in a space. A small space. And in that space, Barack Obama was present. And I saw him. I said, oh, wow, that's Barack Obama. And I went to him. I said, can I take a picture with you? And he said, oh, yeah, well, by all means, by all means. And when we stood to take the picture, he had turned to my uncle, in my own estimation, the most generous member of our family. The most sacrificing man in our family. He had turned to that man. And he began to chastise me and said, look, so you wanted to take picture with Obama alone. What about all these less privileged children that are around you? You were not supposed to leave them outside the picture. So the Lord is showing me that, look, Oga, there is a respect in which you are self-focused. And you are not carrying along this person, this person, this person. And guess what? I honestly did not know. I sincerely did not know. But when I went into his presence and I made that request, I want to know you too. You open light. And when we stand into him, everything that is darkness comes to the surface. It is the reason why we must pursue him. We must seek him. We must long after him. We must long for him. Am I communicating with you? Now, let's move away from there. Let's talk a bit about the subject of the Holy Spirit and the anointing as it relates to your personal ministry and your assignment. Listen to me, friends. We are in the days of his power. We are in the days of great demonstration. We are in the days of great miracles, signs, and wonders. Not because God wants to show some people off as superstars, but because the whole creation, it is time for the whole creation to see the preeminence of Jesus. And he will teach senators, principalities, and powers, wisdom through the church. That is the ordination of God. That is the plan of God. That is the counsel of God. If you are going to be a participant, if you are going to play a role in that, you need to understand these things. Am I communicating with you? The pastor that started, and there are many. And if, you, if you're in fellowship with Jesus, you will know them when you see them. Some men are fake, others are false. A false is the one that has gone to Sangoma, Babalawo, and he has collected power. Am I communicating with you? When God has dealt with a man, and dealt with a man, oh, there are practices, there are practices, there are practices. When he stands as a representative of God, he stands without awareness and consciousness. He doesn't act like he's the one doing it. Can I have 12 men here? If you know you are a prophet, come let us prophesy. He can't do that. He can't say that. Because that is not the Holy Spirit prophesying. That is you using the Holy Ghost. What if the Holy Spirit does not want to prophesy? Anyone open your mouth. Am I communicating with you? Sharp practices. Should I prophesy? I won't prophesy to you again, no. Oh, yeah. Be going, be going. Eh? You are a messenger. Do you understand the credentials of a messenger? His message does not originate from him. He did not send himself. Somebody sent him. So he has to give a report back to the person that sent him. So if the Holy Spirit says you should prophesy, and you say, you know what? 
I'm not prophesying again. Ta lo ma lo ji se fun pe o ji se. Ta lo ma lo so fun pe Olorun ron en se o ji se. Bro, something is wrong with you. And the people sitting in front of you, they are ignorant. That's why they are still coming back. And let me say this to you. There is, there is, there is a criminal following in the spirit. There is something called criminal following in the spirit. When a man has left the Lord and you continue to follow him. It is part of the obligation of heaven to show you when a man has left the Lord. The Holy Spirit has that direct covenant with you. That, you know what that man, Otia, want to get money. Oh yeah, cross to the side. And you know what? There is no minister that is without, that is without areas of his own weaknesses. I'm not talking about Sino. As long as you're a man, there are areas that needs improvement. But when you get before the Lord, he will confront those things. Say so your heart was not right in that matter. Why did you take extra 30 minutes after I've stopped? That revelation you shared, you know it wasn't part of that service. Why did you share it? Conversations between the Holy Spirit and a minister. That he will give you a revelation and wow, the revelation knocked you out. It knocked you unconscious when he gave you. Then you came back to light and immediately you wanted to share it. And it wasn't part of what he prepared for the people. But you, you just found a way in the pulpit and arranged the message and arranged the message. Ah! And the people say, hey! And heaven said, I could imagine a say, Kilo man, she boy. Kilo man, she boy. Don't put him on TV yet. His TV ministry is on hold. He does not know it is the fact that God can't trust him. Even with revelation, they are telling him things and he thinks everything he's being told is for the public. So the Lord breaks the vessels he distributes. Because no other life must be found in the vessel that dispenses the life of God except the life of God. No other energy must sponsor the cause of the kingdom in the life of a minister except God. A man must be able to say, I am what I am by the mercies and by the grace of God. A man must know that his grace towards me was not in vain. I labored abundantly only because of that grace, not because of my intelligence. Paul was a scholar. Paul was a lawyer. Paul was once a member of the Sahindrin. Paul had greater exposure than all of the disciples who were eyewitnesses of the ministry of Jesus. But Paul did not attribute his exertion and his excellence in ministry to those natural credentials and disciplines that was in his life. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen? He said, when I was among you, I chose to know nothing save Christ. And as among you with fear and trembling. How can any pastor say that to members? You were among us with fear and trembling. I saw a minister this morning. And he said, oh. He said, oh. His father in the Lord taught him something. His father in the Lord taught him something. He said to him that, um, you know, we make people something. We make people who are nothing something. And after we have made them something, they think we are nothing. And the church says, hey, who is something and who is nothing? Who among God's people is nothing? That's an expression of despise on the people God has brought your path. Because everybody is nothing. It is the presence of Jesus that gives us identity. We are all at different levels of maturity. And let me tell you the truth. The best of us is yet to show. If you see the best of us, when they come in like you say, ah, Oga, are you sure there is anything in this place? When they told him that, ah, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. Say, now what? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Social science. The king that will save the world will be born where? A, Buckingham Palace. B, 10, Downing Street. Three, White House. Four, Asso Rock. Five, five, Ogba Garage. Pick one. If it is a science course and you did not do the course 
And you just, they, you saw the nature of the question. The king that will save the world will be born where? Ah, uh -uh. your bagarati. Which one does not belong? Have you done those kind of exams before? Which one does not belong in this category? Buckingham Palace, White House, Asso Rock, Ogba Garage. Ogba Garage. And that is where the king is to be born. You know, Paul said that, oh, I do not seek the gift that comes from you, but I seek the fruit that will abound to your account. For I have been instructed by the Lord in all things, both to abase and to abound. You see, the word instructed there is from a root word that means mystery. It means that the word mystery there is a root word that means initiated in silence. I have been initiated in silence before the Lord not to tell people what I need. Do you understand what I'm saying? That there is a mystery in Christ that forbids me to tell people my need as a minister of the gospel. So if the Lord does not provide it, I should sit down there. And when he provides so much, I should enjoy it. But there are times that we make that demand because there's a void in your life. And there's a technology in the spirit for elevating God's people. Part of the subscription is that you give, you minister in the spirit. And when you see, when the Bible says that you, you, you sow in the spirit, sow in the spirit, let me tell you something. According to Galatians, where that phrase was used, it means communicating spirit, natural things to a man that has ministered to you physical things. That is the first definition of sowing in the spirit. Go and check the Bible in context. That if we have given to you, if we have sown unto you um, spiritual things, do we do wrong that you give back to us natural things? Go and read it there. And you say, if you sow into the spirit, you of the spirit reap life. If you sow into the flesh, you of the flesh reap corruption. The first definition of sowing in the spirit is communicating in, with natural things to the one that has communicated to you spiritual things. That's the first definition. And if a man of God lives in the presence of God, and carries the word of God, and labors in secret before the Lord, he never needs to worry about his own material things. They will be taken care of. He never needs to worry. Because the men and the women who will take the assignment from the Lord for his upkeep and for his care, they will receive it. If the person God wants to give does not take it, God will go to another person. If he doesn't want to take it, God will go to another person. But the upkeep of his servant will not be left unattended to by the Lord. He's not a vagabond. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Oh, Sikapale. Fedo Maskapale Sosofela. Lord, we thank you. Am I communicating with you? How did Jesus come? What was the principle? He came, number one, the vessel that carried Jesus, that ushered him into the planet. There are two things that had to happen. Number one, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Huh? Now, the coming of the Holy Spirit was the first step. But there was a second thing. The Bible says the power of the highest overshadowed him. It is the coming of the Holy Spirit that put the seed in there. It is the power of the highest that supplied the strength to carry the pregnancy to, deliver, to delivery. That is the difference between the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When a man becomes born again, he is supernaturally grafted into the body of Christ by the regeneration of his spirit. Immediately, the Holy Spirit is in his spirit, in his regenerated spirit. But he is not baptized, he's not necessarily baptized in the Holy Ghost. So a person can be born again, but he's not baptized in the Holy Ghost. There are two separate activities. Am I communicating with you? There are two separate work of grace. When the Holy Spirit comes into a man, he sanctifies him, he does the work of regeneration, sanctifies him, and by the reason of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that man becomes a member of the universal body of Christ. Okay? However, that alone will not see you through batting your destiny. So Jesus said to them, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endowed with power. Until you be endowed with power. 
The Gabriel said to Mary, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The move of the Holy Spirit is always in power. It's always in power. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit is in power. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, he says, when I come to you, I will not know the words of those that are speaking among you. I will know their power. Because to preach the Bible is easy. He says, when I came to you, I did not come to you in enticing words of men's wisdom, but I came to you in the demonstration of the power and the spirit of Christ. Now, so you need to understand now, that's a different subject, and we'll probably get to it, the Lord permits, that your life must not be devoid of his power. All right? The role you have been called to play by God in the revival and in the current move, you cannot play that role being a good girl, being a nice girl. Being a nice boy. It is not niceness that gives you your place in the move of the Holy Spirit. It is power. Am I communicating with you? And the Holy Spirit starts by anointing you for your duty post in the local church. You see, the local church is the hotbed of preparation. All right? It's the factory where all of us are being molded, being molded, being molded. And that is why it's the Holy Spirit that should tell you where to go, which church to attend. You don't choose a church based on you like the pastor's face or you like his English or the church is close to your house. Am I communicating with you? Do you understand what I'm saying? A person that wants to learn carpentry but he ends up in, in a tailoring office. When he finishes from that place, he's not going to be a carpenter. And guess what? He may not be a tailor either. If your skill is drawing and then you go to a mechanic place, you will notice frustration in that student, in that apprentice. In that apprentice. You've seen parents who have taken their children, well, you can't sit at home. Rather than investigating what the gift, the natural inclination in that child is, and then assign that child to an apprentice that can, a, a, a course or a master that can take him, they just decide, you know what, you are going to be a mechanic. And they take him to a mechanic, but his giftedness is with woodworks. So he gets there, and he's taking plug, putting it where petrol should go into. He's taking petrol, pouring it inside a radiator. He's taking water, pouring it on the steering. And the person that is training him is slapping him. Bwah! Bwah! They think the boy is the problem. He's the person that put him to that place. In like manner, the local church is the hub where God trains his people. You see, look, the truth is, church is a family. That's the first thing. When you come to church, there's supposed to be love, care, all right? Church is the family space where the pastor gets involved in the nitty-gritty of your life. There's no other member of the fivefold ministry that gets involved in the nitty-gritty of a person's life like that. The, the apostle will get involved in the nitty-gritty of your life, but not like the way a pastor will do it. If the apostle goes as deep as a pastor, he's going to lose his anointing and he's going to get frustrated. And you will see anger coming out of him. Because he's been moved into a zone that he's not graced for. But as an apostle who will start a walk, there must be a measure of pastoral um, oppression within him to be able to care for the flock until the pastor comes and take them from him. Am I communicating with you? And so, in a local church, but there's a supernatural atmosphere in the local church that allows us to receive you, in, pamper you, nurture you, babysit you a bit. We come to us and visit you. So, and then we'll dance and laugh with you and say, okay, oh, the Lord bless you. And I say, oh, how are you doing? And then we'll check in on you. And if you, are, if you poo on yourself, we'll take you to the bathroom and do the cleaning. If you wee, we'll collect everything, we'll collect it. But that we are collecting, we're also praying that you grow up. You grow up because one day we'll come, we'll be used cane, you know, instead of just pampering you. Say, so, Oga, come here. What do you think you're doing? Amen? And then it is from the local assembly that the Holy Spirit begins to designate assignments in preparation for your calling, which may be within the local assembly or outside of the local assembly. If the church is correct, postings should be happening regularly. Regularly. We should be commissioning people to go and do their own ministry. Or we should be commissioning people to go and do ministry that extends the ministry that is their own allotment. So the calling of Aaron was within the ministry of Moses. 
Aaron's ministry is within Moses' ministry. It's a legitimate divine ministry from heaven, and it is not lesser in quality than the ministry of Moses or than the ministry of... None of them is superior to each other. That is the calling. Timothy's final calling is in Paul's calling. But notice that there were many brethren that Paul mentioned. Our brother Ephroditus, our brother Sustenance, our brother um, Apia, greet Apia and Archippus for me. The work in their house, the fellowship in their house. Oh, my co-laborers, Priscilla and Aquilia. Those, they were co-laborers, but they did not have inheritance in Paul's calling. He says, my son, Timothy, I have no one like-minded like him who can teach you all my ways as I teach it everywhere and in all the churches wherever I go. Because I can't come to you, I will send him to you. He will do exactly what I would do if I was the one that came. Paracletos. But you can say, well, this church... This church, and then you begin to sample the faces. Say, ah, what are people in the Ah, oh, mercy face. No. Let me check the next one. And as I go in there, you meet Helene and say, Excuse me, where, which church are you going to? Oh, yeah, this is Assembly of Jesus International speaking in tongues. Ekpele Kabo. Oh, we have a place for you without you, church is not complete. So your foolish pride, your head is swelling. And then you enter into the class of a carpenter when you are supposed to be an engineer. Your, your destiny just took a stroll. Let's go like that. Calling is directly related to your training and your preparation. You will have no strength when the day of your calling comes if you have attended the wrong lecture. If you meet a pastor who was called by Jesus, his confidence is not in your presence. His, 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 his stillness in his calling and in his office is not in reliance to your presence or your absence. Your presence doesn't add or remove from his calling. He had been finished in the factory before you came. If you came at the instance of the Lord, you came to do yourself good and you came to further your cause. Yet he's not arrogant or pride, prideful. He knows that you are precious to the Lord, therefore he must invest himself in you according to the will of God, for he's going to be judged for how he deals with you. Am I communicating with us? Oh, if you don't, if you miss that class, ah, idiagbuno. Many years ago, probably about the age of 22, the Lord came in a vision and said, these are the two men I've given to you. Pastor Bakari, Reverend Ariogu. I'd never met the second at any time. Never seen his picture. I saw both of their picture in the revelation. And then I had to go and look for him in Oshun State. And when I got there, I was shocked. I thought it would be a cathedral, like people would think. The, inside the church, it was cardboard that they used in holding the ceiling. Oh, my God. If you see the shirt of the brothers hanging around the servant of God, very scary-looking shirts. Those shirts have no promise of tomorrow. <laughs> and I got that the man just sat on, the, on a chair, was just writing, you know, didn't look, he didn't look flabbergasted that I came from Lagos to Oshogbo or Oshun to come and look for him. He didn't look surprised. He was, you know, a man, you know. He said, yes, how did you get here? I said, the Lord showed me in a vision. He didn't raise his hand, eh? You saw me in a vision. He wasn't surprised. The Lord had killed anything to impress. So he could not be tempted in that area. Whatever the Lord, you don't permit God to kill, is the area where the devil will come and take you. It's the inroad. And when I finished, he just said, all right, do this, do this, bye-bye, come back in two weeks' time. No, he won't even give me transport fare. I'm a young man, no. He just went. Oh, that relationship has blessed me. The first, my pastor, Pastor B, working with him, gave me a revelation of the, my giftings and my revelational capabilities. The second one is the one that poured concrete inside the steel stanchion so that you can have a pillar that can hold a house. And the assignments were different. 
One day he called me and said, KG, you'll be teaching in the Bible school. I said, yes, sir. Do you teach twice a week? I said, yes, sir. And I was traveling from Lagos to Oshobo to go and teach Bible school students, and I wasn't given transport fare, and I was not paid salary. And I did it for about a year and a half, thereabout. Every week. And when I got there, he's not going to be there to say, oh, KG has come. Oh, KG, welcome. Ah, my son, sit down. Let them, uh, please get him water. Get him a bath. No, you are doing it for your calling. He's not, he doesn't need it. That thing he gave you to do, you will think that, oh, you are helping the ministry. No, you are not helping the ministry. He is helping you. In the realm of the spirit, there's contact, connections, and supernatural flows. You connect to a supernatural flow that is coming through a place by joining yourself to it somewhere. And you don't just join yourself by, if you put, if there's a pipe carrying water, and you carry another pipe and put on it, will the water going in the pipe under flow into the pipe on top because you put a pipe on it? Some church members are like that. When they come to church, they just sit down and they do nothing. You are the pipe that they put on top of a pipe carrying water. You are still going to be empty. But what do you do? You look for a place to be engrafted into. They open a hole in the pipe carrying water, join you there and lock that hole. So that what that pipe that is carrying water is carrying can flow through you. You also become a channel and a conduit. Oh, some of my friends say, hey, you are going to Shugbo. They are not paying you salary. You don't even see the man. So what do they give you? I say, well, when it's at night, they give me food. And guess what? At times I go from here to go and teach one student. Why can't we do online? Don't they know that there are devils on the Baduan Express Road? And that I can have accident and die? They never asked me to, they should buy fuel for my car. They never said anything. But me, I know what happened. I know what happened. Amy, more more. More more. The New Testament is gentler. The Holy Spirit being tender is able to help us see certain things easier. The Bible says that Elisha, the son of Shaphat, when the Lord told Elijah to anoint him, the Bible says by the time Elijah got to him, and cast the mantle. Elisha ran back, 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 back. Master, please, let me go and beat my family goodbye. He said, what have I got to do with you? Go back again. The word again. He had followed before. He went back. And then he gave up his business. Ah, it be my made you. Elijah is in full-time ministry. He lives on the mountain. You have a business. That you are doing. The Bible says he had 12 yoke of oxen. The guy was into mechanized agriculture. 12 is the number of government. But this next phase he needs to enter into, he has to shut the door on that, otherwise that door won't open. If you want to hold on to this and say, okay, we'll be dragging this one as we are going here. Elijah, the moment is gone. The season is lost. The office that is about to be vacant is forfeited. So he had to burn everything. He did party, gave the business away, and started following a man. I can see someone saying, Ah, uh, I want him well. I want to get uh, Man of God, I want to get uh, I want to get him, sir. You have been gotten. And then when they wanted to describe Elisha, nobody described Elisha as Elisha the prophet. Elisha, the mechanized agriculturist. Elisha, the engineer. He said, Elisha, the man, the servant of Elijah that poured water in the hands of Elijah. Is that a good description? He poured water in. Ah, that's derogatory. That's demeaning. That's belittling. What are the other synonyms that we need to use? That's condescending. That's abasing. But that is the qualification. That is the entrance into grace. Some pastors exploit it to abuse the flock. It does not change the fact that it's, a mem it's part of the curriculum. It doesn't. It doesn't. How did we get here now? Because that wasn't part of what we wanted to do today. So what am I saying? We're talking about the local church. You know what? Let's pause here. What I started with the workers on Monday, I really desire for us to continue it Tomorrow or next tomorrow. Because again, I say to you, there's a relationship between the local church and the move of God. All right? Now, the Holy Spirit is walking all over the world, and he has different structures. 
There are parachurch organizations, itinerant systems that the Lord has put in place. They are part of his systems. But you see, there is no place as important as your family unit. The fundamentals are installed in the family. After you go to the university and you are done, you will still come and serve within the family and serve within the society. While you are serving within the society, you still must be an active or a vital member of a family. That is why the local church is important. And you must understand how the local church is designed to function. The rules of engagement within the local church, what you are to do in the local church, what you are not to do, how God has structured it, how to relate with authority, witchcraft and manipulation in the local church, where you are the witch. Or where you can become the witch. A witch is not a woman with two teeth drinking blood. A witch is someone that wants to manipulate the emotion of another. And a pastor can be a witch. Am I communicating with you? Every time control is taken away from the Holy Spirit and reposed in a man, witchcraft has started. So if I want you to do something the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to do, and I'm insisting on it, and the Holy Spirit does not want you to, is not saying I should do it, that's witchcraft. And let me tell you something. In the last days, the witchcraft is going to be more in the congregation rearranging the pulpit. That is what is called purpose-driven church. You write letters to the community and ask them, what kind of music would you like to hear in church? What kind of message would you like to hear? When you have taken all the samples and taken the statistics, then you now build a church that fits the demography that you are living in. It is the church, it is the world that has formed the church now. You have simply taken God out of the equation. We didn't see Jesus do that. We didn't see the church in Jerusalem do that. You can have a crowd that is not the bride. Am I communicating with us? Uh, all right. Let's be upstanding. Continue tomorrow.